Andy, and it's wonderful to be here with all of you uh, this morning. Uh, yesterday, as you know, I delivered uh, my first budget as Chancellor of the Exchequer and the first budget ever delivered by a woman Chancellor of the Exchequer, and that was a huge uh, uh, privilege to be able to do that. Uh, in that budget, I've tried to fix the foundations and wipe the slate clean after a lot of the economic instability and chaos we've seen the last few years. I tried to do that in a way that, as much as possible, protected the living standards of ordinary working people. Um, but I did have to make difficult decisions on uh, tax yesterday, but they were necessary to bring the stability back to our economy and to ensure that we had the money for the National Health Service. And I was able to announce £22.6 billion of additional money for day-to-day -day spending in the health service to bring the waiting lists down. And we made a commitment in our manifesto for 40,000 extra appointments every single week in the NHS. And I'm confident that the money that we set aside yesterday will enable us to deliver that, working to, together to deliver that. And in addition to that, £3.1 billion for capital investment in the NHS, uh, hospital beds, hospital improvement, the diagnostic equipment and scanners that you need to be able to do your job. So I hope that that will make a difference to you as staff in the National Health Service. And a huge thanks from Kira and me and all of us for what you do, uh, but also make a massive difference to the patients you treat. So uh, that was the theme of the budget uh, yesterday, but I'll now have, hand over to the Prime Minister, Keir Starmer. Great. Well, look, can I start by saying um, a massive thank you to all of you for, for the work you do. Um, we really appreciate it. Everybody that you care for really appreciates it. Uh, every day you make a difference uh, to the lives of people in and around these communities. So thank you for that. And I do know it's been a really hard uh, few years, um, but we are really grateful for what you've done. Thank you for showing us some of the things you do at this brilliant hospital this morning, because we've seen... Um, what you're doing in relation to strokes, brilliant work um, that was really inspirational, reinforces in me um, what we can do with more innovation, um, etc. And of course with heart valves uh, as well, we saw some brilliant stuff um, this morning. Um, look, we are a government that's only four months in at the moment, um, but I hope you can begin to see the change that we're bringing about. Um, most of all, and really important, we're going to be a mission-driven government. And that means a driving sense of purpose. What are you going to change? How are you going to change it? We've got five missions. The first one is really important, which is growing the economy, which means making people feel better off, which is why the choices that we made yesterday in the budget are so important, making sure that we're protecting working people so that um, in your pay slips and the pay slips of millions of people across the country, you're not going to see an increase in what you have to pay because we're not going to be able to... Uh, lift living standards unless we make that basic protection. But one of the other missions, and there's only five, is uh, the NHS. Um, and the mission there is to pick the NHS up to get those 40,000 uh, appoint uh, appointments uh, and treatments done every week to get the waiting lists down. But to do more than that, um, actually to make sure the NHS is fit for the future. We look very back, back very proudly at the Labour government after the war, which created the NHS in the first place, I think given where things have got to, we now need the 2024 Labour government to pick the NHS up, reimagine it and make sure that it's absolutely fit for the future and um, you'll be doing that with us because we want to hear from you about this. We've got a 10 year plan for the NHS, uh, the change we're going to bring about um, and we need your ideas. I'm a big believer um, in listening to people who are doing the job uh, to get the best ideas about how we can do the job better. And that's been reinforced by the discussions that we've had here in this hospital um, this morning. Um, obviously, it was really important yesterday for us to put more money into the NHS to make sure day to day we can relieve some of the pressure, allow you to get on with the job that you need to get on with. You don't need us to tell you how important that is. Also put in uh, more money on capital for the longer term, the changes, the technology um, that you're going to need. All of that has to be done um, with reform and change at the same time. Um, and what do we mean by that? We mean making much better use um, of technical work, AI, digital, etc. cetera. Um, huge opportunities there for us to move quicker um, and do more. Um, secondly, to move to a preventative model where we're catching things earlier on. Now, you will all know the 
the worst of this. You know, just this morning we're yeah. talking about people with heart problems, don't know they've got heart problems, could have been picked up much e earlier, wouldn't have been in A&E, um, probably wouldn't have been in hospital for three weeks, would have been in here, um, or a hospital like this, being treated much more quickly. So preventative is really important. Um, and then the other big change will be um, to make sure people can access healthcare closer to where they are in their communities. So that, um, again, that can really help on the preventative side, pharmacists doing um, a lot more. So there's a lot of change. We need you to help us with that change because that reform needs um, to happen. Um, but the ambition here is to make sure that we can say um, we've got the NHS back on its feet, which everybody desperately needs and everybody desperately wants, but also an NHS which is truly fit for the future and where you can really look at pride at not just the everyday work that you do, but the fact that your fingerprints are going to be on the model for the NHS for the future, which is a great thing to do. I mean, if you look back at those that were the first people working in the NHS who shaped it uh, for so many years, this is our opportunity um, to do the same. And what we're trying to do is we inherited a pretty bad situation with the budget. There's not much money left in the economy. Um, some of the money that should have been accounted for wasn't accounted for, so we've had to make difficult decisions, £22 billion pounds worth. Uh, of money which wasn't on the books uh, back in March when the last government did the sums. We've had to deal with all of that. That's obviously a challenge, but let's use it as an opportunity to say, well, in which case, um, let's uh, be mission driven. Let's make sure that we get the NHS where it needs to be. Um, I look forward to working with you on that journey. So thank you very much. We're going to now take some questions um, from you. I think um, any of you can ask any question. Uh, it does uh, on the NHS is absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be on the NHS. Uh, you can ask us anything you like. Uh, well, within reason, the camera, <laughs> cameras are rolling, but you know what I mean. Uh, so where should we go? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Amy Burbridge. I'm a consultant in acute medicine. Oh, um, yeah. Hi, Dr. Amy Burbridge. I'm a consultant in acute medicine. I've been working in the NHS for 19 years. Um, thank you for the increased funding. It's incredibly welcome at a very difficult time. Now, my main concern is physician wellbeing and burnout particularly amongst our resident doctors. Now you've announced these huge amount of income that's coming to the NHS. How can we be assured that that income will translate to staffing gaps that we've got, the increasing number of rotor gaps, that over the winter, we're not gonna be really stretched. We're not gonna be working in A&E with short staffed. We're not gonna be working in acute medicine, having to cover lots of different areas, which is incredibly challenging. Patient safety is at risk. Yeah. How can we have some assurance that, you know, this, the money will go towards that? Well, thank you for raising that, because that will be on everybody's mind, whether, wherever they're working in the NHS. Absolutely. There's been a huge strain on for a number of years. Obviously, COVID uh, was very, very impactful. And then the very fact of having waiting lists that are very high is not a good environment for people to work in. And also being undervalued, quite frankly. Um, when the last government wasn't able to bring down the waiting list, who did it blame? It blamed you. Yeah. Um, and that is disrespectful, that undervalues what you're doing. So the first thing, it's not a complete answer, is a mindset change. Actually, some basic respect. My wife, as you may know, works in the NHS in one of the big London hospitals, so the morale of the staff is a sort of daily conversation. <laughs> um, but it is really important because guess what? If you value your workforce and treat them properly, then it actually works better across the piece. But we do need to back that up with a workforce plan to make sure we've got the right sort of cavalry coming through to fill the places that are needed and really go much, much faster um, on the technology that you need to take some of the weight off you. Now, look, I'm not going to pretend that by next week it'll all be fixed because too many politicians um, have done that. It's going to take time. But what we did in the budget yesterday is the first step, the down payment, if you like, down that road to make sure that you can do your jobs um, better and we can have the NHS that we need. Rachel, was there anything you wanted to no, add to that? Really uh, let's go, yeah. <coughs> I need some members that are behind me as well. Yeah, Matthew Pryor, Deputy Director of Pharmacy. So pharmacy teams and their fantastic work is historically underutilised across the NHS, especially as our expertise, skills and scope in legislation grows. So within secondary care, how does the government plan to utilise pharmacists, pharmacy technicians and pharmacy assistants to improve patient outcomes, experience and ultimately reduce some of the work burden on other healthcare professionals as well? This is a, such a good um, question because we can make much better use of our pharmacists. It's an example of the preventative bit and the 
neighbourhood bit, the neighbourhood health service, if you like. Um, there are plenty of examples, and I'll turn to Rachel in just a minute. But this morning, uh, we were, we were looking at some of the work done in this hospital in relation to uh, valves in the heart and their replacement. Incredible um, work that we've just seen with your team here. And one of the points they made to us was that with a stethoscope and AI working together, you could probably pick up the people who needed some of this treatment much, much earlier. And we were talking about whether that could be done. I assumed um, a GP, and they said, no, you could actually get it done in the pharmacist. So that would be an example where quite a simple procedure, listening to your heart with AI to help um, you know, get much more quickly to the root of the problem, then in the necessary case, pass the person on uh, much more quickly. Huge um, benefit because people are going to be in the pharmacist for all sorts of um, reasons. Fast tracking into where they're needed if they're needing it, cutting out the A and E bit, which then takes the pressure off your colleagues um, because uh, that's where a lot of the pressure is. Um, and so it's an example, or others, vaccines, etc. But Rachel, I mean, I think this is an area we really want to push hard on. Yes, so yesterday in the budget, we did a spending review to settle budgets for this year and next year. But late next spring, we'll be doing settlements for at least another couple of years uh, after that and capital budgets for five years. And so we've now got this sort of breathing space for the next six months to work on the second stage of the spending review. And what I don't want to do is just put more money into doing more of the same. I want to do things differently because we don't want to get to the end of five years of um, our government and think, well, we did everything that was happening, but just a little bit more, because I think we could do better than that. And certainly from all the conversations that we've had uh, here with staff and that I had uh, at St. George's Hospital in, in South London in Tooting earlier in the week with the, the health secretary, that all of you are buzzing with ideas about how we could do things differently, get better value for money and better outcomes for patients as well. And that's why uh, Kia and Wes launched last week uh, the, the consultation so that we can hear directly from patients and staff, so that we can you know, see the best things that are happening at the hospital here in Coventry and make sure that they're happening in other trusts. But similarly, there'd be stuff happening in Leeds, where I'm an MP, uh, that could also be useful in other trusts around the country. So sharing that best practice and this consultation is a really key part of that leading up to the next spending review. But these two questions are linked. Yeah. Because if it's possible to take to identify people before they present at A&E, um, then obviously for the patient that is a whole lot better, but it also takes the pressure off your colleagues because um, people are presenting at A&E who could have been pulled out of the system, as it were, and um, treated in a different way at the right place without having to resort to A&E, then reduces the pressure. So we've got to look at this um, in the round. It's not, is this job here at the expense of that job there? It's actually joining this up. And then, as Rachel rightly says, doing it across the piece. Mm. Let's go to another question. Yes. Thank you, Prime Minister. I was really pleased to hear your words about valuing the NHS workforce in response to my colleague. Um, um, I'm a cardiologist. I've been working in the NHS for a while. What we've seen for the last few years is increasing pressure, increasing environments where staff feel... Um, that they're being um, worked harder and harder and the burnout question comes back again. And I wondered if part of this is a cultural change. My concern is that we're going to, with a focus on increased productivity, that we're inevitably going to be looking at, and AI will help with that. But there's going to be even more pressure on staff to deliver more and more. Is the government going to have a focus on cultural change within the NHS? so that they're, we're more working more as a collaborative uh, team and environment. Look, thank you for raising that. And let's, let's have a really honest discussion. We need to value um, staff more than they've been valued by the last government, in my view. And I think it was shocking the last government simply tried to blame the staff for the problems that the government's making. That isn't the way that you um, get the best out of people, create the environment in which they're having to work, and they're under a huge amount of pressure. In A&E, one of the pressures is we don't have enough scanners with the scan results coming back more quickly. That's where the real problem is, so we need to identify that. But I also want to be honest with you. We are going to be asking more of you. There's no point in me standing here and saying your workload will go down. The whole point is people are living longer. 
um, they've got more conditions. What the NHS is facing now is different to what it was facing in the post-war period. Your workload is likely to go up, not down. Now, in a way, that is a good thing because we're living longer. We shouldn't see that as a bad thing, but it does make your life more complicated. So are we making a bigger ask of you? Yes. Um, are we going to help you, therefore? Yes. Make sure we've got the right trained staff in the right numbers where you need them. Making sure that AI and technology is your friend um, so that some of the things that can be done um, better and differently are done. I mean, there are so many I examples. Um, the taking of the same details from the same patient over and over again um, seems to me a repetitive process which we could cut out quite easily. I've spoken to... Um, uh, up at um, Alderhey Hospital to some of the parents whose children were in hospital. And to have to walk through and explain over and over again what had happened to their children was really, they were just so emotionally, they didn't want to walk through again. Um, and so I do think there are things that we can do that which will alleviate the pressure. But are we going to make a bigger ask of you? Yes, because we're really proud of what you do. We want it to be even better. And the demands are going to go up. We can't stop that. That's because we're living longer, um, et cetera. But can we, using technology, preventative measures, uh, making sure it's more localised, change the very way in which we carry this out? Yes, we can, and that will take the pressure off. So you're doing more, um, but actually the pressure will come off if we do it in the way that we need to do it. But that is the reimagining of the NHS. So we don't want to be a government that simply managed the NHS a bit better than the last lot. That isn't our ambition. It's to change... Um, in, in a good sense, I know there's been too much top-down change in my view in the last 10 years, which didn't help anybody. Um, you know you know about the reforms that took place when it were 10, 12 years ago. that all had to be reversed. We're not interested in that sort of reform, but genuinely changing the way in which you work by making use of technology, different techniques, using colleagues um, in a different way, in a collaborative way. That is part of what we're talking about. Rachel, I mean, this is a big part yeah. of what you're driving at. I just want to say a couple of things on, on this. When I became Chancellor, one of my earliest decisions was whether I was going to accept the uh, recommendations of the independent pay review bodies. Now, the remit was given to them, those pay review bodies, by the previous government, and the previous government had had some of those recommendations before the election but just sat on them. Uh, and when I got them, they were already several months late because you should have had your pay rise in April and it was already July by then. And I decided to accept in full those recommendations and give public sector workers in the NHS, but also in schools and the police and the armed forces, the first meaningful real terms pay rise in 14 years. And I think that was the right thing to do. It brought industrial action to an end. And to the point that Amy made right at the beginning, I think it is important that we value staff who work so hard uh, properly. So that's one side of making sure that people are properly motivated and respected for the jobs that they do. But also, and again, this is from a, a story when I was at a different hospital recently, and they said that they were using equipment that should have been replaced five or so years ago and had been bought more than a decade ago, and it often didn't work, and it meant they weren't able to do some of the things that I've seen and happening in the hospital here today. <laughs> And that reduces the productivity and the efficiency of what you're able to do. It's not your fault, but that's the equipment you're having to live with. And one of the reasons that happens is that the previous government always raided the capital budgets yeah. uh, to pay for the day-to-day -day spending. Well, I can understand why, because there's massive pressures today, <coughs> but it does no good for the next year and the year after if you're not investing in either the hospital building or the capacity uh, with, with the number of beds, etc., or doing the repairs in hospitals, or you're not buying the diagnostic equipment and scanners and stuff that can make you more productive in your job. So we've got to make those longer-term investments to drive those productivity and efficiency performance as well. Any more? Lady behind. Uh, oh, yeah, let's, oh, excuse me, we're just going to go behind, otherwise we'll never go behind. Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen McLaughlin. I'm a paediatrician and have been for a very long time. Um, so every week in my clinic, I see probably at least one child now with liver damage secondary to obesity. And they don't need me. What they need is somebody that can take them out and do a junior park run or play football with them at lunchtime or walk them to school. How are you going to address that preventative issue? Uh, because my problems that I see now are going to be my colleagues' problems in 10 years' time. Yeah, I mean, this is part of the preventative piece that we've got to get our arms around, whether it's obesity or anything else. I mean, obesity is the example you give, and it's a really important one in terms of the number of children presenting um, with some sort of obesity. There are other examples, again, to use the example of Alderhey. 
I, I went to the heart um, uh, ward there. It was the most incredible to see two-year-olds having heart or just having had heart operation. But I was really, really shocked to know that the single most common cause for admission to Alderhaste Children's Hospital for children aged 6 to 10 has had the teeth taken out because they're decaying. <laughs> so those brilliant staff, uh, as is brilliant staff here, are being used to do something which is completely preventable. Um, and we have to get to... People who say nanny state, I'm sorry, if the price of intervening or the price of not intervening is a child having his teeth taken out um, or a child that then has to present to all of your colleagues for the rest of his or her life, uh, then I'm in favour of intervention and doing something about it. And that is a part of what the public health prevention piece is um, for us as well. It's why we're doing what we're doing um, in relation to smoking uh, as well. They're difficult decisions and people think that they are nanny state. I think they're common sense <coughs> um, and we've got to get on and we've got to do it. Uh, Charlotte, can we come to you? Yes, of course. Um, uh, do we need a microphone? <laughs> and then we'll come across here. Thank you. So um, I'm Charlotte. My question will probably follow on a little bit because I'm the public health midwife. Oh, okay. Um, so, so working as a tag team. <laughs> <laughs> Unplanned. But so obviously, as we know, the, the support and care that can be given by midwives and obstetricians through pregnancy, the positive impacts that that can have on child and adult health, you know, are, are massive, particularly if thinking about preventative measures. Um, does the government have any plans in terms of focused funding towards maternity? Is that something that, you know, the investment in would allow us to do that a little bit more? Great. Yeah, I mean, it's really, both uh, Karen and your question, Charlotte, are really uh, Im important. And just, uh, just uh, first of all, just on what Karen was saying, but one of the things that we want to do as a government is not just like different parts of the NHS working together and preventative within the NHS, but also different government departments working together. So we can give Wes Streeting and the Department of Health as much money as you like. But if we're not uh, having active kids in our schools and uh, children having access to, to, to PE and good coaches and all that sort of stuff, then we're not going to be able to tackle some of the issues that, that you um, speak about. And similarly, if we're going to get people off sickness benefits and back into work, we need an NHS that is treating people efficiently and quickly. Otherwise, the department work and pensions budget is just going to go up and up and up. And so we want to do things differently like that as the government with different ministerial teams working together uh, to, to, to make sure that the money is, is, is well allocated. Uh, Charlotte, I think your point is really, really uh, important as well. The focus of the announcement yesterday was about trying to meet that 18-week target between referral and seeing a consultant in a hospital, but we know there is more that we need to do uh, in the NHS around ambulance waiting times, around uh, A&E, around uh, uh, maternity health uh, uh, as well. Uh, we've given this £22.6 billion settlement to NHS England. It's up to them then to allocate the, the, the funds, uh, but you know, I absolutely recognise the points that you're making. Then we come over, I'm sure I saw some hands here. Yes. yes. Hi, Prime Minister. I think um, it's on. Um, my name's Rachel Chapman. I'm public health consultant here, so it's a great theme running through this. So our strategy is to be more than a hospital. So this shift that we're talking about from NHS treatment mm -hmm. to more prevention is absolutely music to our ears. Um, I was wondering, can you talk a bit more about what the plans are in terms of how we can contribute to this as part of the NHS, as well as working with our partners? Yeah, this is really important because on prevention, on the best things to do, the things that work, you're likely to know more than I do. And therefore, if this is going to be done, it shouldn't be done from Whitehall and Westminster with politicians sitting um, in a sort of you know, windowless room trying to work out what prevention is. It's got to come from real live examples. Um, and I'm a, m a massive believer in this. The, the people who are doing it on the ground will have a really good sense of examples. This really worked. This made a real difference. So what we've got to do is give you and others the opportunity to put those ideas, those good practices on the table. That's what the big consultation that uh, West Streeting, the Health Secretary and I launched um, about two weeks ago. Please use it. Mm. Um, put your ideas in there. They're all being looked at. Um, make sure and we, make sure we understand what inhibits good practice across different trusts because I know that some things are happening in some places, they're really good, but are they happening in, in every part of the country? My sense at the moment is there's different bits of good in different places around the country, but there's not a consistent good in every place in the country. Now, 
That may be a matter of collaborating and coordinating. It may be something we need to look at. Is the framework too rigid? Is it too bureaucratic? Does it stop you sharing? Is there, you know, uh, are there things in place that mean something that's actually been quite well tested in one place is having to be redone all over again in the next place when it could perhaps be passported through more quickly? But um, this will only work if you put your fingerprints on it. So please make sure that you're feeding in um, those ideas to us. The mindset is there. The willingness is there. We'll take that on. Um, but the best examples are probably going to come from you. And I've, I mean, when I've, I ran the Crown Prosecution Service, this is, the, as the name suggests, the Prosecution Service for England and Wales. We had 100 offices. And I used to go to every office on a pretty regular basis and talk to the staff and say, what are the three biggest challenges or headaches you're facing? With? And what's your workaround? Because if you've got a problem in the office, you've normally got a pretty good idea of how you'd actually fix it. And some of the best ideas we came up with were the ones that the staff said, I tell you what, if you fix this, it'll make a massive difference to my life and we'll be much more efficient. And uh, so we need to get into that mindset. So thank you very much. I think we've got time for maybe one last question. Oh, we've got three here. Uh, let's go to you. So let's see if we can pick up three very quickly. Hi, Prime Minister. Uh, I'm Ankur. I'm Community Integration Lead. And my question is, as per um, what you've said, care closer to home, that's what you want. That's what your government want. And I'm part of the community group. Okay. And my key question is, how are your government or your new allocated fund, how would you ensure that they are kind of uh, allocated to community services? Um, because that's where we want uh, our services to go. Uh, yeah, let's do all three, and we'll try to do a sort of see if we can do a bridging. Uh, <laughs> of... Cheers, thank you. I'm Nick Aldridge, the head of research delivery. We know research active hospitals have better patient outcomes, regardless of patients engaging with research. How will we ensure that we continue to offer that, and more sites become research active across the UK? And uh, Hazel. Hello, I'm Dr. Cook. I'm on consultants palliative medicine and I think my question is we're talking about prevention but we all know that at some point we're going to die and how are we going to ensure that we can provide that care and support for patients and their families and those close to them where they wish to be because a lot of people do die in hospital and how can we help our health services social services and also neighborhoods to support them at where they wish to be yeah Rachel do you want to start on any of those um, I might take uh, Nicholas's um, question um, around uh, research uh, and using the, the health service. Um, this is something that myself and West Streeting, but also our digital science and innovation secretary of state, Peter Kyle, is really uh, interested in. We held uh, an international investment summit in London a couple of weeks ago where we had some of the biggest investors from around the world uh, come to the UK. And one of the big pharmaceutical companies announced uh, a trial that they were going to be doing in Manchester. Now, the reason they like doing trials in the UK is because of our National Health Service that uh, people from uh, all different backgrounds, all income levels, all different uh, ethnicities are treated on the National Health Service and that means you've got a really rich environment for doing uh, that research and access to data. But we need to do better in enabling uh, that data to be used for those sorts of things because it means that new drugs, new medicines can be trialled here in the UK with better outcome for patients but also more income uh, for the National Health Service as well. And so that thing around data, not only uh, can it help on the day-to-day -day running, I believe, of the, of the health service, but also it can really drive that innovation. And that's something that we are really, really focused on because it's one of the main, one of the real things that's uh, great about the health service is that we treat everybody regardless of background, but it also means that it's a really great place to test new drugs and we want access to those here. I mean, let me just pick up the other two questions. If I may. Firstly, the question of... Um, you know, where we are for our final moments, where we spend those final moments, is a really important one. Um, and I think, by and large, not everybody fits in this category. Most people would rather be at home, in the home environment. And my dad died in hospital. My mum didn't. Um, but, it, you know, it is inevitably more difficult to say your goodbyes, to spend your last moments. It's not to say a that there's nothing wrong with a hospital environment. It's just, you know, my heart of hearts, I know he'd have probably rather been in his own home and we'd have probably rather been in the home with him with his familiar things around him in the way that they are at home but they can never be um, in hospital for that to happen we have to have a sort of home first um, principle if you like and that means building up social care and making so all social care and the sort of care in the community that is available is on the basis of, of, of home first where it's possible to do it it's not going to be possible in all cases which you um, uh, know 
Um, and that means that what we're doing on um, the health service, the NHS, has to be integrated with what we're doing on social care, what we're doing with local authorities. Um, and that's the sort of joined up the work that we're trying to achieve through um, the missions that we have in government. None of them are going to be within one department. They're all going to have to be um, across department. And um, doing the necessary work on social care is, is a really important priority um, for us. In relation to um, preventative work and the allocation, look, some of that, you know, it isn't for us to sort of say where everything should happen. That is um, for yourselves, for the trust, for NHS England. But there needs to be a join up here, um, I think, to make sure that we have got uh, the right stuff going on and that where there is good practice, it's being shared. So um, that is very important to the way in which we want to do business. We're running out of time, so can I just take the opportunity to say just two or three um, final things? Um, the first is there is this consultation on the 10-year plan for the NHS. It won't take you long. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's not, it's not a great thesis. It's not a great um, exam question. It's somewhere for you to sort of put in your ideas, um, big, small, and all the sizes in between, as to what would make a difference, what, what, would, you, what would you like to see done differently. Um, so please make sure that you do that. Secondly, and um, uh, importantly to us, um, the day after the election, I stood outside Downing Street and said we'd be a government of service. And that means that we're a government which is in your service. So the opportunity to talk to us, that's not um, a great gift that we're giving you this morning. That's actually your right. You have every right to tell me and Rachel what you think. You have every right to be heard on this. So we're not being generous, gathering you round to listen to your views. We are actually letting you exercise your rights, because if we're a government of service, we should be listening to what you have to say. And for that reason, I don't want you to think this is the only opportunity I'm ever going to get to influence what Keir and Rachel are thinking. And therefore, through the member of my team who organised this visit, we will make sure that we get um, details to you so that if there's anything you want to send through that you want me to think about, Rachel to think about, then please use that. And, and I can tell you, you know, some of the, I, I'm one of these people that, you know, on the train on the way home, and ruminate about what people have said to me and think about it. Um, so it really is impactful if you do that. So um, you have the right to tell us what you think. You've got the right um, to put your fingerprints on the future of your country. 